Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 25. The responsive reading is in your bulletin. Please join me. To you, Yahweh, I lift up my soul. Oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Make me know your ways. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Be mindful of your mercy and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions, According to your steadfast love, remember me because of your goodness. And now please join me in the Apostles' Creed found at number 881 in your hymnals. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is in the little black book, number 2112, Jesus Walked This Lonesome Valley. If it's comfortable for you, please stand and please sing.
our loving creator. We are grateful this morning for the beauty of your world and for the beauty of this place. God, as we see the sunshine streaming through the stained glass windows, as we feel the warmth of it, we are grateful for those saints who gave of their livelihood to provide this building and these beautiful windows. God, their witness carries on long after most of them are gone, enlivening our worship space bringing joy to our hearts. Reminding us that we find you in beauty as well as in truth and in goodness. And God, we give you thanks for the beauty that surrounds us in your world. for the trees and soon for the flowers, for the animals of the field and the birds of the air and the fishes in the creeks and the river. God, you have given us an abundant world. And as we enter this time of contemplation, these Lenten days, as we walk with Jesus in the wilderness this morning, we are reminded that even in the wilderness, when you are there, there is beauty. And God, we remember that you are always there and here with us wherever we go, loving us more than we can know. God, we have so much to be grateful for. But we remember this morning those for whom these lengthening Lenten days will be full of grief, full of pain, full of struggle. Oh God, we pray for those who grieve. We pray for those who hurt. We pray for those who struggle. Keep us always mindful, oh God, that since our Savior Jesus is now with you, that we are his hands and feet and face to all those in need on the earth. Help us remember, O oh God, to walk gently, to speak kindly, to act lovingly. Help us remember to behave as our master would have us behave. God, we pray this morning for those who do not have enough, and we pray for those who have too much. May the needs of the one be met, and may the, need, may the heart of the other be softened. God, we pray for the leaders of this world in politics, in business, in 
education, in science. God, let them be leaders after your own heart. And God, we ask that you look upon us on this Lenten morning. And soften our hearts. Remind us to ask for forgiveness. And God, once we have done so, we know that you are faithful to forgive. And so we lift up the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn this morning, number 269, Lord who threw out these 40 days. Please stand if it's comfortable for you to do so and let's sing that and then we will sing the other doxology because now it's Lent. All right, everybody ready? Let's stand and sing. Together in the doxology. Gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verse 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart 
and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'm going to start with an assumption this morning, which I know is always dangerous. So when I get it wrong, y'all tell me, but please wait until after the service. I suspect here that for most of us, those who grew up Methodist and those who grew up Baptist, Lent may be one of those rather mysterious Catholic seasons, all tied up with eating fish on Friday, and giving up things. The truth of the matter, of course, is that Lent is about far more than what you do or don't eat for the 40 days preceding Easter. In its earliest forms, Lent seems to have been connected with the preparation for baptism, which traditionally happened on Easter Sunday. Prior to their baptism, converts to the faith were expected to go through an intensive period of repentance, self-examination, prayer, and preparation for their new life in Christ. That period could sometimes last as long as three years. But the final 40 days before Easter were always the most important. That connection with Easter, by the way, is the origin of the word Lent, itself. It's derived from the old Anglo-Saxon and old German words for spring, lengthen, because that was when the days lengthened. Hello? Oh, okay. Uh, we may not be preparing for baptism at Easter, but like the ball players trooping off to spring training to refresh their skills before the season, did anybody not know it was spring training, by the way? I will pray for you, my sister. <laughs> anyway, like spring training, Lent offers us a time to step back from our busy lives and consider the basic skills and dynamics of our faith a time of re-preparation for the ministries to which we are all called. The model for this time of preparation is Jesus and the 40 days he spent in the wilderness after his baptism in preparation for his ministry. Mark, Matthew, and Luke all write of Jesus' time in the desert and his temptations there. And although Mark's version is the briefest, there are some things in the few short verses he uses to tell this story that are worth unpacking. The wilderness, or the desert, is a setting with rich resonances in the scriptures. In the normal course of human life, the wilderness is an empty, dangerous place. Frightening. And this was certainly true for Jesus and his contemporaries and for the generations that preceded them in the Middle East. Certainly, in part, the wilderness connotes testing and failure in the Hebrew scriptures, for it was the failings of the children of Israel in the desert that caused God to have them spend an additional 40 years in wilderness wanderings before admitting them to the promised land. But the desert was also a holy place for the Jews, the place where their ancestors had encountered God. Later, it was where the prophets retreated to have their own experiences with the Almighty. In Jesus' time, the Essenes had retreated into the wilderness at Qumran to escape the corruption of life under Roman rule, and zealots were hiding in the desert to nurture their hopes of a renewed 
Jewish state. For Jesus, the time in the desert was a holy encounter with God. Unlike the rebellious children of Israel, Jesus spends 40 days, not 40 years in the wilderness. And unlike them, he defeats his temptations. Unlike the Essenes, Jesus came back to civilization with a redeeming word. And unlike the Zealots, he preached a spiritual kingdom of God, not a temporal kingdom of humans. And one of the things that made and still makes the wilderness a dangerous place was the type of wildlife encountered there. Scorpions, snakes, lions, and other animals posed a real threat for a lone human being in the desert. Part of what Mark is doing with his comment that Jesus was with the wild beasts is reminding his readers of just how real Jesus' trial in the desert was. If Mark wrote his gospel around A.D. 65, as many scholars believe, then this was something his audience could relate to in a very particular way. For it was around that time that the infamous Roman emperor Nero was subjecting Christians to being ravaged by beasts in the Colosseum. <clears throat> Mark may have been comforting both those in danger and hidden survivors by reminding them that their Lord had triumphed over similar beasts. But he may also have been pointing them toward other scriptures of hope. Some commentators see in Mark's reference to the beasts a picture of Jesus inaugurating the peaceable kingdom envisioned in Isaiah 11. Listen. The wolf shall lay down with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The suckling child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then again in chapter 43, Isaiah records this promise from God. Behold, I am about to do a new thing. I will make a way in the wilderness and wild animals will honor me. If Mark is tapping into the vision of Isaiah, then he is picturing Christ as the new Adam, restoring, if only for a limited time and place, the relationship that God had intended between humankind and the other animals of creation. It's a reminder that wherever Jesus is, the kingdom of God is present. Likewise, Mark, Mark may have mentioned the angels ministering to Jesus in, to comfort those who were in danger from Nero's circus beasts. But this too may point back to Jesus' restoration of creation to God's intended state. In the story of the fall, once Adam and Eve have succumbed to temptation and hidden from God, they are driven from Eden. And their return is forever blocked by angels with flaming swords. When Jesus seeks the face of God in the wilderness, he overcomes temptation. And the angels are there to help rather than to hinder him. All of these biblical allusions aside, however, this story should also have resonance for our day-to-day -day lives. All of us know the presence of Lenten places in our lives. Each of us has traveled in the wilderness. Each of us faces temptation. Each of us is tried by beasts in our lives. And hopefully, each of us experiences the ministry of angels. For some, the power of Lent is its acknowledgement that we live our lives in struggle against temptation, armed only with the hope that we can follow Jesus in his victory against the tempter. One of the familiar things in this story may be its 
portrayal of the rhythm of life. Jesus is baptized by John at the Jordan and the heavens open up and he is proclaimed as the Son of God, a figurative mountaintop experience, much like the literal experience on the mountaintop in last week's transfiguration story. But after the spiritual high of that experience, Mark tells us immediately he is plunged into the valley, a time of wilderness and testing. That's what life looks like for us, too. The good times are so often followed by challenges. But we have Jesus' example to remind us that the valley times are not only to be expected, but that through the Spirit of Jesus, we have the power to overcome them. This is a good thing to know when we're confronted by the wilderness times in our lives. I think you know what I mean. The wilderness times are those times when our interior landscapes look more like windswept deserts than green pastures when our souls feel as dried out as a sand dune and we have all the strength and joie de vivre of a blanched steer skull. These are the times in our lives when we fancy we can feel the vultures circling us. In the wilderness of our lives, we feel isolated and helpless against the challenges before us. The challenges seem bigger than we are, but... If we take this story seriously, then we know that Jesus has been in this place too. If Jesus could transform the desert of Judea into an Edenic paradise, then the spirit of Jesus within us can help us transform the desert places of our souls back into something living and loving. That is the great resource available to us. In those wilderness places in our lives, we, like Jesus, can encounter our living God and be ministered to by God's messengers. We need simply to open our lives to the Spirit and trust that the gentle touch will come. Jesus spoke to our perhaps most difficult spiritual wilderness places when he said, Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? But seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all these things will be yours as well. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient. For the day. Of course, sometimes we do seem to be our own worst enemies. Jesus encountered wild beasts in the wilderness. We may often find the beast in ourselves. We have the potential to be very, very dangerous, we human beings. Late in his career, Johnny Cash recorded a song by Nick Lowe called The Beast in Me that I think speaks some truth to this situation. It includes these lyrics. The beast in me is caged by frail and fragile bars, restless by day and by night, rants and rages at the stars. God help the beast in me. The beast in me has learned to live with pain and how to shelter from the rain and in the twinkling of an eye might have to be restrained. Sometimes it tries to kid me that it's just a teddy bear and even somehow manages to vanish in the air and that is when I must beware of the beast in me that everybody knows they've seen him out dressed in my clothes. God help. The beast in me. I think all of us recognize the beast or beasts within ourselves. The question is, what do we do with them? If we allow Mark's story to point us toward the vision of Isaiah, we learn that Jesus transformed the beasts, 
reforging the relationship with all of creation that God intended for humankind. Through Jesus, God transforms the things in life that repulse or frighten us. For many years, one of my favorite plays, one that I've directed and would love to have another shot at someday, is Arthur Miller's 1964 play, After the Fall, named for that unredeemed state where all human beings live for at least part of their lives. In the play, set in the early 60s, the protagonist, Quentin, uh, becomes involved with a German woman named Holga. Holga tells Quentin that toward the end of World War II, in the depths of cynicism, depression, and self-doubt, she had really wanted to die. But her life changes, thanks to a dream she has, night after night. In my dream, she tells him, I have a child. And even in the dream, I could see that the child was actually my life, and that the child was an idiot. I ran from it, but that idiot child always found me and crept back onto my lap and clutched at me. Holga then explains that, odd as it was, the dream became a turning point for her life. She says, in the dream, I thought, if I could just kiss it, Whatever in it was me, was my own. So I bent to its broken face, and I kissed it. I think one must finally take one's life into one's arms, Quentin. Through the power of the Spirit of Jesus, our beasts can be tamed. Our wilderness places reclaimed. The kingdom of God is indeed at hand for us, as Jesus said, if we repent and believe the good news. Now, please hear the word repent carefully. It should not invoke God rubbing our noses in the messes we've made. It should be a word of hope. We are called to stop running from the brokenness of our lives and to embrace our lives. We are called not to despair over our faults, not to allow the beasts in us to become wilderness, but to hope. John Claypool wrote, perhaps a U-turn is the best modern anal analogy for repentance. If you look at repentance deeply, it comes as a profound sense of hopefulness. I believe there is hope for all of us in this story of wilderness and temptation and beasts and angels. There is good news here. Jesus, like us, was tempted and struggled. Jesus has been in the wilderness. Jesus has tamed the wild beasts. Wherever we go, whatever we face, Jesus has been there and points the way for us. More than that, though, his sacrifice, through his sacrifice and his rising, Jesus gives us the power to overcome temptation, to move from wilderness to pasture, and to accept with hope the good news that our sins are forgiven, our beasts are tamed. We are not called to live in a dreary penitence, but to take our place as joint heirs in the kingdom. This is the promise of Lent. I want to close this morning with these words from the Catholic lay minister, scholar, and poet, Susan Fleming McGurgan. That's the good news of Mark's opening scenes. No desert on earth is so remote, so barren, so seemingly inhospitable to life that Jesus hasn't walked there first. And his presence in the wilderness reminds us there's something else true about deserts. Despite all appearances to the contrary, the wilderness is filled with life. 
A handful of desert soil, baked and brown, blowing in the hot wind, can be filled with hundreds of seeds just waiting for a chance to bloom. That withered plant, desiccated and dry, has living roots reaching deep into the ground. That empty landscape, lonely in the harsh light of day, comes to life in the moonlight as reptiles and insects emerge from hiding. Even at its most desolate, the desert is always ready to burst into bloom at the first sign of life-giving water. Maybe that's why God so often uses the desert as a place for transformation. Maybe that's why Jesus emerged from the waters of baptism only to be thrust into the wilderness. This Lent finds many of us traveling through the desert, wrestling with demons and tempted by evil. Some people might look upon that journey and despair. But we, we know the truth about deserts, don't we? Even for the desert times in our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our last hymn this morning is a hymn of hope. Number 534, Be Still My Soul. Please stand if it's comfortable for you to do so, and let's sing together.
my sisters and my brothers, let your souls be still. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.